Welcome to Biochem 2.0 with the new textbook. This is chapter two, which is how we see the invisible world. So basically, um, there are different types of microscopy. We talked about this last week in class um, that we can use to visualize different structures. We have bright field microscopy, and this is what we're usually using in uh, the lab. And this is what is going to show uh, that there is a darker image, so the actual cells accept themselves are dyed where there's a lighter background and this produces a very clear image of the cells and this happens to be in CSF um, fluid where on the right here we have um, a brighter image on a darker background and so you can do different types of staining you can do different types of light light technique so that we can see different details and look at different cells um, dependent on what we need to be looking at um, so basically how we can change the difference of these and how we can um, utilize it for what we really need to see is we can change like wavelengths, right? And so a uh, couple different terms that we need to do, the amplify or the amplitude is the actual height of the wave where the wavelength itself is the difference distance between a peak to another peak. So amplitude is again going to be the height of the wave where wavelength is going to be the width in a way, right, from the peak to peak. These waves have different frequencies and therefore they have different rates of vibration. The wave at the top here it has the lowest frequency where at the bottom it's like um, it's a higher frequency. So I kind of think of wavelengths as like gnats or bees or whatever, you know, like the lower ones are just like, think of a big old bumblebee. It's like low buzzing, whatever, versus a gnat. It's like, right. And that's going to be the higher frequencies. Um, so a couple different things that we're going to be looking at and using, um, you know, we're going to use Petri dishes in lab, right? And these are, Petri dishes are made of plastic. Um, they used to be made in glass, but they're disposable now, right? And so usually the ones, or the, all the ones that we're going to be working with in lab are going to be made of plastic. And this allows um, for a transmission of a high proportion of light, i.e. we can see through them, right? And then this transparency um, we can use because like if you use a dissecting scope, you can look through um, and actually look at the growing microbes without even opening the, um, the container itself. Where if we have um, an opaque object like this meteorite, light can't pass through it with the material so it's impossible to actually look at it with um, on a microscope with light passing through so this one we'd have to use like um sem or tem or like a dissecting scope in order to actually see what's going on um we talked a little bit about this in class and refraction all right refraction occurs when the light passes from one medium like for instance, air to another, such as the um, surface of the glass. And then this is gonna change the direction of light rays. And um, you can see that a little bit more in this um, figure where the light, pay, light rays pass from one medium to another and it may either be refracted or reflected. So reflected is going to be bounced off right so you can see the incident ray comes in and then it's reflected right so kind of like your reflection in a mirror it's bounced back to you where refracted means that it's going to pass through but at an altered path um so here's an example we talked about this one in class about like the if i took well it's lemonade so you really can't see it but lemonade and a um, pencil and put it in there not going to because i want to kind of drink that lemonade right but it's going to change um the the angle of what the pencil or pen or whatever i'm putting in the water is going to look like so this straight pole here appears like it's bent at an angle as it enters the water and this optical illusion is due to the large difference between the refractive indexes of air and water Okay, so that's kind of like a fun little magic trick that you can play with um, little kids or, you know, whatever. You can be like, oh, I can bend a pen. Look at this, you know. Um, so a couple of different things with lenses. You have some prisms, which are going to separate light. You have convex lenses, which are going to focus them. And then concave, which again is going to spread even more. So a lens is like a collection of prisms. 
such as the one shown here. When light passes through the convex lens, it's refracted towards a focal po point on the other side of the lens. And then the focal point is the distance um, to the focal point. So this is kind of like how glasses work, right? Where light passing through a concave uh, lens is refracted away from the focal point of the lens. Um, here is like when we were talking about the wavelengths, this is what the wavelength scale like looks like, right? And so we have different amounts of energy, frequency, and wavelengths, right? This shows our visible light spectrum. So you can see I have this beautiful shirt sweater thing on, right? That has a lot of different colors. All of these colors that we see are within the visible light spectrum. Things that we can't see are like, um, uh, infrared radiation, um, television and raves, radio waves. I mean, it would be kind of crazy if I could look out my window and see all the radio waves bouncing everywhere, TV waves bouncing everywhere, right? So we can't see all of the wavelengths that are in the world. We can just see those visible wavelengths, which we interpret as color. So the electromagnetic spectrum ranges from high frequency gamma rays to low frequency radio waves. And the visible light is relatively small. As you can see, it's only this tiny box range of electromagnetic frequencies that can be sensed by the human eye. Um, on the electromagnetic spectrum, visible light falls between UV and um, the uh, infrared light. Okay. Um, I told you that uh, in, during my PhD, I actually did a lot of fluorescent microscopy. And so the fluorescent dyes that are absorbed by these um, cow pulmonary artery endothelial cells emit uh, brilliant colors when excited by UV rays, un rays under fluorescent microscopy. So basically, um, you can use different tags on different antibodies, and they can um, then fluoresce under different wavelengths. So when you're using a fluorescent microscope, how you can do it, it's the same microscope, but use different um, lenses or actually different filters on the lens. So you would have to change the wavelength to like a specific color for emitting red lights and a specific color for blue lights and a specific color for green lights and so it's really cool because you can therefore stack these uh, different tags and you can look at a lot of different cellular details so a couple different um important dudes here that um unfortunately girls didn't ever get really any of the credit they were girl scientists too just saying but anyway, the ones that we're going to talk about are Lewin Hook, and he's credited as being the first person to observe microbes, which includes bacteria, and he called these bacteria animalcules um, and we little beasties, which is kind of cute if you like, think of it. So even though Van Leeuwenhoek's Hook's microscopes were simple microscopes, they were more powerful and provided better resolution than the compound microscopes back in his day. Right. And then, um, the, even though Gal Galileo um, developed the telescope, he was, um, it's actually, yeah, Galileo. It, he was also one of the per pioneers of microscopy. And so if you guys are like me, you're saying Galileo, Galileo, Galileo. No, not me, just me. Gotcha. Anyway, he was a very important scientist. Um, so Hook is one of the guys that was really um, credited as being a flower founder of microscopy, and basically he used the compound microscope to look at cork, right? And so both of these engravings are from his um, seminal, which means groundbreaking work um, on microscopy, right? Micrographia, which was published a long time ago in 1665. And so you can see by using different light sources and focusing in the light, he was able to look at small cells. And this is what the little different cells of a cork look like. Zacharias Johnson, uh, along with his father Hans, may have invented the, uh, the telescope, uh, the simple microscope and the compound microscope during the late 1500s and early 1600s. But um, back then, rec records weren't really kept. And there's a lot of... Um, differences in who decided or who found what it's kind of like watson and crick were um credited for um you know discovering the double helix but there were also other scientists that were at the same time making the same discoveries but watson and crick were the ones that got credited towards them so we discovered this and we discussed this at length in lab um and we will be using microscopes in almost every single lab uh, this semester so do make sure that you are comfortable and aware of the different types of the microscope um anatomy right 
the different parts of the microscope because we will you will be tested on it a and b it, they are very beneficial to know so you have your eyepieces the stage stage clip your light source the diaphragm the diameter uh, light adjustment etc okay so make sure that you are very familiar with these <clears throat> Um, we will also be using oil immersion, immersion, like I said, um, the different oil immersion is going to be used at 100x on our microscope. And what that does is it's going to change how the light passes through, right? So um, again, we would get focus up to the 40x, then put a little dab of oil on the slide, put it into the 100x objective lens, so then it breaks that tension. And then um, the light is just passing through that oil, um, as you can see here and so with the immersion oil the light source is passing through in a nice um, way where in the 100x without the oil the refraction is bending the light as it passes through the class glass therefore not giving you quite as sharp of an image um so we will be using 100x objective lenses uh, quite extensively in lab and this is to improve resolution and again, the reason it works is because it changes refractive indices and um, makes them a more sharpened image. Um, an opaque light stop inserted into the bright field microscope is used to produce a dark field image. The light stop blocks light traveling from the illuminator um, to the objective lens, allowing only the light reflected or refracted off a specimen to reach the eye. This is important, guys, because we don't want to burn out your eyeballs, right? And so basically only a small amount of light so if i took like a flashlight let me use my phone here and i shined it in my eye well i'd kind of go temporarily blind right but if we just make it a pinpoint of it then that's not as bad so that's what we're doing so that we don't blow out our eyeballs um we will do a couple things here in microscopy and um this is actually really cool because it's vice versa of what you're used to seeing and it's just really cool to look at things underneath the dark field microscope. And this is, allows us again to, you, to view living unstained samples of, in this case, a spirochete. And so this is kind of like a negative, which a lot of you guys probably won't even know what a um, photography negative is anymore because everything's digital in this day and age. Um, but basically it's opposite of what you would see with the naked eye so you know normally we're used to seeing the cells themselves stained in dark field or dark versus a light background but in dark field it's flip-flopped um this diagram of a phase contrast microscope illustrates the phase differences between light passing through the object in the background and these differences are produced by passing the rays through different parts of the phase plate. Um, the light rays are superimposed with the image plane producing contrast due to the interference. So basically um, down here in step one, um, an annular stop in the condenser produces a cone of light that's going to be focused on that specimen and then the objects or the specimen uh retracts or, re or refracts or reflects light and then the light is going to be traveling directly from the condenser lens and light traveling through the specimen or out of phase when they pass through the objective and um the phase plates and then the wavelength in the phase in or out of the phase um either are together or cancel each other out okay and so it's, this is going to again discriminate, describe and illustrate the phase differences between the light passing through the object in the background. These differences are produced by passing the rays um, through different parts of the phase, phase plate, and the light rays are superimposed on the image plane, therefore producing a contrast due to the interference. So with this guy, um, it's showing you bright field imaging. And um, just on the left, you can see it's kind of plain Jane. You really don't get to see a whole bunch. And so then what you can do is use phase contrast. And that's what we were just talking about, just applied. And you can see that in this picture. So um, these are unstained samples, squamous epithelial cells, so skin cells that are squishy, squamous ones, right? And the cells are in the center and the bottom right of each photograph, center, bottom right, right? Um, and this is artifact or cellular debris. Okay, so notice that the unstained cells in the bright field image are almost invisible. You can see them, but not very well. But then when we use the phase contrast, they really just pop, right? And so we can use uh, our science knowledge to figure out how to best visualize the different cells. 
Um, so we get to grow some things on auger, um, which is um, kind of like a jello substance that feeds the cells. And this is um, a type of a, of, of a, of a microbe. And this fungus causes chromoblastomycosis, and this is a chronic skin infection that's common in tropical and subtropical climates. But you can see that you can um, detail a lot of the uh, outer images and stuff because we looked at it in a microscope under a microscope where if we were doing this with uh, just a naked eye we would not be able to see these things um looking at these guys again we're using immunofluorescence so you can use a fluorescent tag uh, on, on an antibody and um this is actually um staining gonorrhea okay um so uh nicesuria gonorrhea so it's the microbe that causes gonorrhea and then an indirect immunofluorescent stain is used to visualize a larva of schistotomona mansoli which is a parasitic worm that causes schistosomosis i butcher words guys and this would be an um an intestinal disease Okay, and then um, you can also use direct or indirect. So direct would be you're staining directly onto the um, the antibody, or the antibody is going to stain directly onto the uh, organisms. Where indirect, you're going to be bind um, binding to the antigen and then the antibody. Okay, so we can use a lot of different things to visualize what we need to see. Um, confocal microscopy can use to visualize structures such as this roof dwelling cyanobacterium biofilm. And so again, you know, basically the whole purpose of this um, whole chapter is to show you the different types of microscopes we have, different ways that we can look at different microorganisms, either with a naked eye, with simple stains, with more complex antibody stains. But then we, this is how we know what we know with science. Okay. Um, this is a, a TEM microscope, and my sister-in-law um, teaches the uh, uh, scanning electron microscopy, and I believe they have a, a transmission electron microscope at Central. And so um, it's very, very cool, and you can get amazingly detailed images. Um, electron microscopes, they work a little bit differently than um, our regular microscopes, and this is good because that means that we can get the really... Um, detailed images where with just a simple light microscope we can get some awesome images and go up to about a thousand times what the um the magnification would be from like our naked eye but with scanning electron microscopy or transmission electroscopy we can get very very detailed images one of the ways that we can do this is that the microscopes the electron microscopes use magnets to focus the electron beams um, in a way that like mic light microscopes use light okay so electron electron are charges right and so um, that would make sense magnets magnets have uh, poles positive or negative poles right so that's how we can utilize them to get very very um, detailed images um, these pictures compare the components of the transmission electron microscopes with scanning electron microscopes. And so transmission, you have high voltage, electric gun, first condenser lens, condenser aperture, which controls the light, how much light goes in. And then we have a second uh, set of those and then specimen holder, airlock, right, the electron beams. So these are very expensive microscopes and they can give you very detailed images. Like I said, Anna, um, she does things on pollen, right? So she has some amazing um different things, uh, images and stuff on pollen. So maybe I'll pull those up in class and show them to you. And then same with the scanning electron. Um, you know, again, the <clears throat> you're going to be coating them in like gold or fine metals so that you can really see some details. So it's also very expensive to do these. Um, so over on the left, this is a transmission electron um, microscopy image of the cells on the biofilm. And so one of the biggest deals differences here is you can see the transmission transmits through. So you can see like the inner guts of the cell where scanning is it coats the outside. So you see more of the morphology. So um, that's one of the biggest differences between the two. Scanning goes um, surface, right, where transmission transmits through. Okay, so anyway, you can see the structures in the transmission where the scanning is going to give you the three-dimensional images. Um, so what is biofilm since a lot of those different um, 
questions just talked about biofilm. Biofilm forms one free-floating bacteria of one or more species is here to the surface, produces a slime, and forms a colony. So this is like pond scum, but also, you know, if you have like sweaters that grew on your teeth because you didn't brush your teeth for the weekend and it's kind of like gross and mm, that's biofilm too. Okay, so brush your jumpers. Um, with this image, there are multiple species of bacteria that are grown in a biofilm on stainless steel. And this is stained with DAPI. Oh, I used to use DAPI. Uh, DAPI just stains every single cell. And then this uses epifluorescence microscopy. So you can see that there's a whole bunch of cells that were grown on the silver plates so that you can show that biofilm can grow pretty much anywhere, including your teeth, right? Mm -hmm. It is anyone like feeling their teeth right now and be like, oh, mm, I need to go grab a toothbrush. Yeah, yeah, no, just me. Okay. See how uh, at my desk here, I also have like a toothpick and floss. Neurotic, right? Okay, uh, uh, the S scanning transmission microscopy, right? So um, this shows how, how close you can get in an atomic level. So again, scanning electroscopy is going to be using um, like a fine metal that to coat. So this one uses gold, like pure gold. So it's, again, very expensive to do one of these uh, samples. I mean, it's micro microscopic, so of course it's going to be very, very, very small. But still, it's... Um, it's the um it, it you need it to be able to get that great image so this is um shows the individual atoms that of the gold arranged in different columns where this one shows long uh strand like molecules of nanocellulose nano meaning small cellulose is um like a fiber right a structured thing and this is a laboratory created substance that's derived from plant fibers um all right so here is um are some images of the different types of microscopy that you can get light field dark field phase contrast differential fluorescence confocal and two phase so you can see the key uses of things and then some different images so you can see how detailed things are um and then the different magnifications transmission again transmits light through and so you're going to be able to see the internal structures where scanning is bounced off and so that's going to be more surface right um scanning tunneling uh is the stem that we just talked about where atomic force is more of the details as well okay um so uh talking a little bit about microscopy techniques um basically we're going to be doing some heat fixing um in our slides i show you how to flame them to heat fix but people can use um like hot plates or a heating element or you can place things into fixative as well like formalin um so um next time we're in lab show, ask me to show you some formalin fixed uh samples specimens from next door um, so basically the specimen can be heat fixed using a slide warmer like this one what heat fixation means guys is like okay if I have it's kind of think of it like as a, a shirt say I have a white shirt on and I spill coffee on it if I just you know wash it and get it out it's gonna more than likely get off but if I throw it in the dryer what's gonna happen to that stain it really settles into that fabric and then you're gonna play hell trying to get it out right so this is kind of the same concept that heat fixing does but just for specimens so if you just put a specimen on top of a microscope slide and you let it dry fine it'll be stuck a little bit but if i like put any water on it or whatever and it rehydrates that sample's just gonna fly off right and just wash off so by heat fixing it the way i show you you use a flame but they're being real fancy and they're using hot plate right but basically it, it bakes that sample in so that it's more set okay so this heat specimen can be heat fixed by using the slide warmer um if you really want to be old school you can just use a lighter right and you can heat fix it that way right i have candles here i do not smell. um another method is to use um a micro incinerator i talked about these a little bit they're very cool i used to use them to um sterilize instrumentation between surgeries right so you again it's the same concept heat and then also you can use tissue fixation using formalin or formaldehyde paraformaldehyde um so this is what a lot of the samples um that you'll be using either in the vet clinic or um in autopsy right they take a specimen um from the sample from the patient 
right? And then they would fix it and um, embed it. And then, you know, this is a multi-day process or at least a multi-hour process, right? Depends on how big the sample is. <clears throat> um, but this will last a lot longer than, um, you know, like formal and fixed tissue is good forever, right? And so it's why like bodies are embalmed, right? Et cetera. Um, so staining, uh, you can stain different things to be able to look at different characteristics. This is, um, looks like anthrax cells have been absorbed by crossoviolet, and this is a basic positive stain. And so we get to learn about all these different things, and you will be doing crossoviolet stains. And so this is why I say don't use, uh, or don't wear white in the lab, and make sure to wear your lab coat, right? Um, this one is stained with rose bengal, and this is a positive um, acid stain. So this is a basic stain. This is a uh, acid stain. And so I, I don't believe we use rose bengal unless I change some things on me. But again, the whole point of this is that you're getting contrast, and it can be specific for different types of cells. So especially when we use like h &E stains, hemotoxylin and eosin, they're going to be attracted to different cellular types based on cell charges so that we can stain and counter stain and really look for details in um, the different specimens. And then this one appears to be white because they did not um, absorb a negative stain that was applied to the slide. So in this case, you know, the negative stain um, stained the background where the cell itself did not absorb it because the cell was um, not the correct um, charge. Um, gram staining, this is one that you are going to be using extensively uh, through the lab, and it's very cool, but it's a differential staining technique that uses uh, primary stain and secondary counter stain to determine between gram positive and gram negative um, bacteria. So step one is going to be the crystal violet, and it stains the cells purple or blue, and then iodine is the cells remain purple or blue. Alcohol is a decolorizer, and the gram-positive cells are going to remain purple or blue, where the gram-negative cells get kind of washed off, and they are going to be uh, colorless. And then you counterstain with safranin, and this is where their gram-positive cells, again, are going to stay purple, where now the gram-negative cells are going to um, absorb that safranin, and they're going to appear pink and or red. Okay, so we're going to use gram stains a lot in this class. Um, in this specimen, the gram-positive bacterium, Staphylococcus aureus, uh, retains the crystal violet dye, the purple dye, even after the decolorizing agent is added, where the gram-negative um, bacteria, which is Eschestera coli, E. coli, right? Uh, this is the most common gram stain quality control bacterium, and this is the one that is decolorized, and it's only visible after the counter stain of safranin is applied. So here is another example of just showing um, the purple cells, right? So it's um, a different dye, different cell type, so we can use different things. Um, Zeal Nelson has uh, also stains, um, and it can have rendered um, these mycobacterium tuberculosis cells red in the surrounding growth factor blue. So again, the contrast can show the difference in the different cell types, and it can really point out what we're looking for or, um, you know, if it's just background artifact. Um, India ink, this is actually very cool as well. You can actually see India ink um, move underneath the microscope all by itself. It's really cool because you can see like the vibrations. And so if I can find some India ink next time we're in lab, I'll show you this. Because, I mean, it's just ink, like ink that you write with, right? And you can see, I think it's the carbon molecules bouncing off each other. It's it's very cool. Anyway, so India ink was used to stain the background of these cells in the yeast, uh, Cryptococcus neoformans, and the halos that are surrounding the cells are the polysaccharide um, capsules. So remember, look for those root words. Poly means multiple saccharide as a sugar. And so basically, polysaccharide capsules are big capsules of sugar around um, the yeast cells because yeast survives off sugar. And then over on the right-hand side, we have cresyl violet and copper sulfate dyes, and they can not penetrate the encapsulated bacillus cells in this negatively stained sample because um, of charge differences or um, because it's just an impermeable cell membrane. And so because of that, the encapsulated cells appear to have a light blue halo. Okay, so you can see that they have little um, halos around them. It's pretty cool. Um, here's another uh, example where stain preparation of Bacillus subtilis is showing endospores as green, right? And then here, and then the vegetative cells as pink. 
So again, we can use stains for a lot of different very cool things. Um, flagellar stains, uh, we get to do some of these too. So you can see the little flagella, the little tails go bloop, 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 and flip all over, right? And this is a common cause in foodborne illnesses. And this reveals that the cells, these cells here have numerous flagella used for locomotion. I can't wait until we get to see the pond water sample. And I think that's coming up here pretty soon. And if for some reason we're not doing it this year, I will find a pond water sample for you. Cause, oh my gosh, these guys have a ton of flagella and they just whip all around and it's so cool. But like I told you guys in lecture, this is one of the main reasons why I will not put pond water in my mouth and swish it around and spit it back out when I'm swimming in open water <laughs> because I know what grows in it. But still, they're very, very cool. Um, so here is a couple, another different comparison thing. So we have basic stains, acidic stains, negative stains, um, the specific dyes that are used, the purpose of them, the outcome, and sample images. These guys are going to be fantastic for you guys um, to study and have around when you do your lab practical. So I really suggest getting familiar with these and understanding them. Um, same type of things here with gram stain, acid fast, endospore stains, flagellar stains, and capsules. Right. So um, make sure that you are very familiar with these. Um, so when we were talking about, they shouldn't be using their fingers, by the way, when we we're talking about um, the different types of tissue preparation and how we can prepare samples, here are a couple different ways, right? We talked about heat fixing, we talked about um, formalin fixation, right? This is what you would use more like, um, okay, so for instance, my brother-in-law is a Mohs surgeon, right? And he has a cryotome in his office because it allows his technician to take the samples from the patient and analyze it right there in the um, office without having to send it to outside labs and having to wait days for results. Because with Mohs surgery, what's cool is they make sure that you have a clear margin around a sample of um, like cancer. So say you have cancer here and you cut like a margin around like above one millimeter, you can then, um, you know, stain that tissue and make sure that the margins are clear. If it's not, go back in and clear, like take some more out of the patient, again, recheck, et cetera, until you get clear mar margins. So mar Mohs surgery has a much more reduced risk of reoccurrence of cancer at that spot than just normal cancer um, like mole remover, removal, et cetera, because of like being able to look at the specimens in office. Um, so tools that they use here is an ultra microtome. Ultra just means really, really, really small. Microtome is the machine that you use to cut the um, specimens in like one or two micron um, uh, slices. So remember I told you in lecture that one hair um, width right, is about eight microns. And so two microns would be what a quarter of the width of a hair cell. So very, very, very thin. But then we can see a lot of details that we need to um, be able to see. So here, a technician is going to use the ultra microtome to splice a specimen into those thin sections so that we can see whether or not the cancer is, or whatever this is looking at, but in the most surgery, see if the cancer is cleared or not. Um, so here's a couple other different examples of staining. So this is a living unstained spirochete that can be used under dark field. Um, in this bright field image, modified silver stain is used to visualize the spirochetes. Even though the stain kills the cells, it increases the contrast to make them more visible. Where down here, we are going to be using scanning electron uh, microscopy just to see more details. So SEM is not used diagnostically because A, it takes too long, and B, it's very expensive. But if you want to do some scientific studies, you can look more for um, like the morphology and um, things than you would want to do TEM or SEM. Um, again, we talked a little bit about how we can use antibodies um, to identify different cells. And so this would be an indirect immunofluorescence uh, stain can be used to identify the, the T palladium cells um, are there. And again, this is the causative agent of syphilis that would be present in a specimen. So for instance, in this example, you would use the primary antibody to attach to the T palladium cell. And then the secondary antibody, which is going to be targeted or um, attached to, linked to, uh, tagged with of fluorochrome, which fluoro is just fluorescent, chrome is a color. So this just means a colored tag that would be attached to that primary antibody so that we can actually see um, <clears throat> things in really, really pretty colors, right? In contrast. 
Um, and that concludes your chapter two lecture. We'll see you guys in class.